So our uh, topic this afternoon is mega hive. How to how to build a big, healthy hive. How many people here are currently beekeepers? I know we have a couple. You ordered bees. Um, go ahead and flip the slide, Lars. Ultimate brood nest is kind of how you build a big, healthy hive. As big, you let them build as big as you can, and there's kind of a process to get that to happen. That's just a picture of hives here in the valley that I've worked on, taken care of. Um, these are in, both of them two hives are at the end of June. Um, so that just goes to show you what we can do here in the valley. That one that I'm, that I'm actually standing next to, that is up, um, roads draw up that direction out in the woods. So this doesn't have to be out, you know, down in the flats. That's, that's a forest hive. So it's, that's what you can do in the woods. Next one, Lars. That's just a, uh, them, them ain't local hives. Um, but that should, as a hobby beekeeper, that should be your goal. That's Tim Ives. I don't know if you guys have heard Tim Ives. Um, he's actually who I've got a lot of my techniques from on beekeeping, how to get them that high. It's, it's a management process to get them to be that tall. Once they start getting to a certain point, they're going to want to swarm just because they're that big. Um, I have a few hives last year that I did not have to do swarm management on because of size. They just, they just did that naturally. We have a couple more pictures. Go ahead and flip it through, Lars. Um, most of you already know how to get bees. These are just pictures of the two different types of bees. Is there anybody who doesn't? Do you know how to purchase bees? So bees come in a package, which is on that side. That's how they come nailed together. This is a nucleus hive. This is a package. This is what they come in. And this is a nucleus hive. This is, um, and I won't go into detail on what the difference is between the two here and this group here. Let's just go ahead. Bottom boards. That's the first piece of equipment that you need on the hive. And some of this I'm going to go through and might seem kind of, you know, like it's beyond you. But when I first learned how to build a, a mega hive, I asked the first gentleman that had tall hives like this what he does different than everybody else. It was here in the valley. He was 80, I think 82, somewhere in there, had busted his hip. He had four hives. It was the second week of June. He had three deeps and four honey supers full on four of his hives. Um, nobody in Flathead Valley at that point had I seen had more than two deeps and a honey super. So his hives were twice the size of everybody else's. I asked him how he did that, how he kept bees different than anybody else. He told me I don't. I said, yeah, right. I mean, you're, you're doing something totally different than everybody else. You have hives that are two, three times bigger than everybody else. I had him walk me through how he kept bees. And what he was telling me in his body language were two different things. And so I'm going to go through what his body language was telling me after I broke him down to what he was doing different than everybody else. So that's why I'm starting with the bottom boards. The bottom boards, you have two different types of bottom boards. You have a solid bottom board and you have a screen bottom board. Um, those people who use um, try to go treatment free, one of the ways to combat mites is using a screen bottom board. The solid bottom board, if you're using a solid bottom board, you're going to be treating bees some other way with a vaporizer or a chemical. That's, that's the treatment that, so whichever way you're doing bees, um, them are the two bottom boards. Go ahead, Lars. A slatted bottom board. A slatted bottom board, um, most people do not use, but when you're creating large hives, you need as much of that space inside that hive to create bees. There's bees in that hive when you have a strong hive. They don't have a job. They just hang out in the bottom third frame of your frames of your bees. You need some place for them to go so that the queen can lay in that bottom third. 
Um, so the frame of bees, that's what a normal frame of bees would kind of look like. Um, that's all cap brood on there. But when, if you don't have a slatted board to bottom frame your hives, you're going to have bees hanging off, and a third of the way up is just going to be covered with bees. The queen can't lay there. So that's the configuration of how your bottom board is going to sit with a slatted board. This one also has what a lot of people call a hive stand. It's kind of a landing strip ramp that sits in front of your hive. Um, your commercial guys don't use that, and I would say three quarters of your hobbyists don't use that. Um, some of my hives, I use them, some of them I don't. It, it gives them some place supposedly to land when they're full of nectar. They don't come in bombing hard, the general landing. That's, that's the theory behind it. But the important part is, is the bottom board with the slatted board. That front part of that slatted board that's wide, that has a purpose also. The queen doesn't like to lay where it's light. So that keeps the, the shadow, the, the, your entrance daylight, keeps it dark so she comes all the way down and lays in the bottom part of that, that hive. Does the slatted board go on top of the screen board or in place of the screen board? On top of it. Or, or the solid bottom. Wh whichever type of bottom you use, whether it's screened or solid, the slatted board is the next piece of equipment on top of that. Any other questions so far on the equipment we're using? So this is, this is how you're going to start your bees. Um, and this is um, one of my setups here. I keep my bees on a stand that look like that. They're 18 inches off the ground. 18 inches is a magic number um, for keeping your bees off the ground. It's a skunk control. Skunks are the start of your, your failure of your bees. They come in at night, tap on the side of the hive. The guard bees come out to see what's going on. The skunk eats them. They can polish off 2,000 bees a night. If you're losing all your guard bees during the night, during the day, the yellow jackets come in. There's nothing to protect them. The yellow jackets are hammering your hive. So your hive is spending its whole time trying to protect its hive rather than forging. It's always trying to create new guard bees. It's so it starts with keep, keeping the skunks out of there. Um, entrance reducers, also you want to have an entrance reducer on there to keep the yellow jackets out. I leave my entrance reducers on all year round. It doesn't get hot enough here to have to leave that open so that they can cool the hive down. We very seldom have temperatures that they actually even have to fan to cool it down. No, I, it depends on the strong, strength of the hive. Um, if it's a weak hive that I'm dealing with, I keep it on the small one. But generally, it's the widest opening that's there. Um, when you're first starting out, like you can see in this picture, that's a small entrance. That's what you're going to have when you first start out until um, they start building up and can produce the guard bees they need. And you'll know when it's time to change it. The bees will start jamming up. You can see the one. They're kind of jamming up right there. I wait till that jam up's getting about twice that before I, maybe even three times that before I make the bigger entrance. They just, they need to have the guard bees um, there to be able to protect that bigger opening. Go ahead and flip it. So this is the second deep. I just place the second deep right on top. Um, but I pull the third and seventh frame up. In the third and seventh frame, you're pulling brood up into that upper box. It forces the bees to work that box more. It gets rid of the bee space, and they need the bee space. They, they're, they're, it makes them more productive. When you say you pull them up, do you replace them with an empty frame? Right. I just, the, the two new frames that, that they took the spot, I just put it where it's at. So the third and seventh frame I pull up. And that actually has a name to it, and I don't know what that name is called. And where do you place them on the, where do you place them in that box, on the edges? The right, where, right where they came out of. Oh, okay. So I, I, pulled a, I, just, I just trade places with the third and the seventh frame. This is one of my future beekeepers. Just thought I'd have a picture in there. Um, you can see that they spend a little bit of time in the bee yard. 
he's trying to catch some bees with his hands. Um, that there, I'm, I'm checking the hive. It's a, it's a two deep hive. I'm checking to see if it's ready to add my third deep. I, I make sure that I have my brood chamber is filling up, you know, four of the frames at least on top. It kind of an egg shape, you know, in that frame. Um, so four to five frames I have brood on that top box before I put in my third box. So this is a third box and a honey super. When I add the third box, I add a honey two super at the same time. So my third box, when I put it in there, I put it in between the two deeps that are already there that have the brood chamber. I'm sp you're splitting the brood chamber. I raise the third and the seventh frame up again into that middle box. And you're splitting the brood chamber now. There's brood on both sides and you have a bridge for that queen to go back and forth. Um, and that puts the bees into a high production mode of building wax. Once all that wax is built out, she has a huge amount of space to lay eggs. She can lay as many eggs as possible. Um, go ahead. So you're putting that second um, box, or the third box in the second slot, is that what you're saying? Right. I'm, I'm splitting that and putting it in between the two. What keeps them from, that's just a honey box. Nope. That's the third deep. So I have, I have three deeps there and a honey super. So I haven't got to the honey super yet. I'm still talking about putting in that third deep. So what happens is they, they build that out in a hurry because it's not supposed to be there. They don't want it there. So they, they go, they, it, they like mass produce honeycomb. And they say that a queen lays up to 3,000 eggs a day. I'm here to tell you that she can lay more than that. Because if she couldn't lay, if that's all that she could lay, she could only keep roughly two deeps full of eggs. Her brood chamber couldn't, couldn't get bigger than that. My experience has been within three days, she'll lay out that, that middle box. Three days after I open it up, if the bees are productive and, and laying wax, or making wax, I've gone and checked, and it's been almost completely full of eggs. Can I ask how often you change your queens? I don't. Don't you let them do it? I, I, I don't go in and change my queens. Um, artificially, commercial queens that are artificially inseminated, they have a lower egg laying rate. I don't, I, if you let your bees do it naturally, I, my, my queens have all, I haven't had to replace them. You know, they, they just, they, they do their job. Um, so, at the same time that I add that third deep, I add a honey super on top of my emery shim. I don't know if you can see it there. Um, an emery shim is a three-quarter inch shim that goes round. It has an entrance in it. Um, I do that. I started doing that with my winter configuration, and I left it on there. And the bees tend to use that entrance more than they do the bottom entrance. That's why I continued using it. But what I found is that they're able to per haul in more honey faster, or it seems to, they're more productive with that entrance up high. Um, there's no proof of that, it's just been my own observation, so I continue to do it. I don't honestly know whether it helps or not, that's just an observation that I've made. So I add that same honey super, and they start building that out at the same time and start packing honey in there. You, now, if I'm understanding right, your emery is between your entrance, between your brood and your honey super. Between my brood and my honey super. Do you ever need to move that up or just stay I right just, there? I just always leave it right there. And we'll get into that, the reason why here in a... Um, is that the queen excluder? I don't use queen excluders. Okay. I, I don't use them at all. I didn't last year either. Um, and, and the next one I'll get to talk and how I, how I utilize my frames as a queen excluder. Um, so as you can imagine, if she lays out them eggs, that box, eggs that fast, when that batch hatches, your hive's going to explode. And while she's laying that, laying that out, the rest of your hive is, 
is hatching, so there's all this empty space that when she's done laying there, she can just move around and she, she never runs out of room to lay. She can always lay to her capacity that she wants to do. So when that explodes, that one box isn't going to be enough, especially if the honey, honey super is going. You have this mega amount of bees trying to produce, put honey in there. To You've got to get more boxes on there in a short amount of time. This is just a, another picture of this person here uses all deeps and uses the mega hive system at the same. Even her, her hives, when they're up this high, they're all deeps. Um, same way anybody else lifts them. They're heavy, but you work off a ladder, and it's just part of the, part of the deal. Um, she won't go to mediums. <laughs> She's not very big lady. So when I add, the next time I add, um, I add at least two honey supers. Um, and the, the, how I add the honey supers, as you can see there, them two brown ones, they were added directly above the brood chamber. So bees, when they're in the wild, they, build, they, they take their honey from the top down to their brood nest. And in the fall, or when they're getting close to swarming, that the honey is coming around the brood ball. So by adding our equipment always on top, we're doing completely opposite of what bees want to do in the wild. So if we take off our full honey supers and we put empty honey supers directly above the brood chamber, we're mimicking how it is in the wild. So if you add at least two honey supers at a time, they have plenty of places to put their honey. The one that's directly above the brood chamber, if you leave that an empty, not so undrawn comb, that acts as a queen excluder. The queen will not go across that comb if it's not drawn out with wax. So it keeps her down in the box. I have never had any queens have a brood chamber bigger than three and a, a honey super. So it, even the ones that I have tried to put a fourth deep on there, they won't make their brood chamber any more than another honey super above the third box. So that's, in my experience, that has been the capacity, the biggest that I can make that brood chamber. So at this point, when you get a hive that's this big, some hives at that point, just because of their size, are going to want to swarm. Nothing to do with that they don't have space. Nothing to do with just because of the size, they're going to gonna want to swarm. So at this point, it takes some management on your part to make sure you're going through. You, you can't just add equipment now and ignore the brood chamber. You're going to have to go through there and make sure you find swarm cells. You know, either that or you're going to have to split the hive and create a new hive. Because at, at this point, that, that's what they're going to want to do naturally. Us newbies who have lost count now, can you point out what, you, what each one of those boxes is from the top? So the first three white ones that are on the bottom, them are deeps, brood chambers, um, high bodies. Them are the, kind of the three names that you're going to hear most of your knowledgeable beekeepers call them. Um, a, a deep or a brood chamber is kind of the most common that I that I hear that I'm around. Um, every now and again, you find somebody that calls everything a super. Um, but for the most part, that's. And then the, the two natural colored ones and the ones above that, them are honey supers. Um, mediums is another thing that they call them. And a medium is it's just there's deeps, there's mediums, and then there's shallows. Um, but And that's the size of the box. They're nine and. Anybody know what off the top of their head? Nine and five eighths or seven eighths? Any other? I mean, it's two, each one is two inches shorter. So, and poundage wise, if it's full of honey, a deep is anywhere from 80, 70 to up to 100 pounds. Um, and a honey super can be the 60 pound range. It's 60. They say 80, but I'm, I'm not. I'm going to say 40 to 60. So there's, there's some considerable amount of weight there, especially if you're, you're up here. So 
So you've got four then total? Okay. On this one, yes. Um, last year I had some of my hives had eight. Honey supers on top of them. I, I think yeah. them ones I was working a six foot ladder, but I have an eight foot ladder too. I'm just saying if you get too many boxes, I'm trying to figure out between the number of bees you have, but is that how they know when they want to swarm when they get to a certain number or is it the space that they're on? Normally when normally when they swarm, they swarm because they don't have space. Right. But when you when you get them this big, it has been some of my some of the hives, they start building um, swarm cells just because they have space, but it's just it's so big, it's bigger than what is natural. And I'm not answering, asking the well, question. Yeah, space and number. Yeah, so even if they're accommodated and everything, and if it's too big, they'll depart. You yeah. Question. The question was, is if they're too big, they'll depart. Yes, that's been my experience. Some of the hives, you know, if they get too big, they're going to want to swarm. They're just they're they're bigger than what nature intended them. So that's, um, that's their trigger. Is to... Yeah, in in the in the wild, a wild beehive doesn't get much bigger than a nucleus hive. You know the the cavities that they're they're in there. So that's. I was, I was thinking, is, there, is the number then? There's something in the number of bees, right, that makes a, a hive. That if they get past a certain number of bees, or well, I don't I don't know. Because they all don't. Some of the hives, I, as big as I can make them, I don't have to do anything with them, as long as they have space. But I have had hives that, just because of the size, is the only thing that I'm going off of, because there's nothing else that would have made them swarm, because I had space in there. It's ironic, because I saw that you're implying that the hives are more individualistic than the bees themselves. <laughs> Seriously, that's what I'm hearing. I'm, uh, I'm saying, you know, that there, there are a hive. They're all the individuals are just part of a hive. Oh yes. Uh, individual hive. Yep. Have different personalities. Yes, the whole hive. Yes, correct. Okay. Yep. The, the, the hive itself has each individual hive has its own personality, right. okay. and and the reason for that is is they all come from the same. You know, that one mother is the traits right. go through that whole hive. It's. She kind of their right? right, and it. Yeah. I read something about not putting too much empty, you know, space there. Could that be the the question is is she read where there's too many, too much empty space. The books that you read, everything that I've read says that. Um, talking to old beekeepers um, and other beekeepers, and my own experience, that hasn't been the case. You know. Can you put on too much space? I think in the spring, when they're first getting rolling, if you leave your hive, you know, put every, all your empties on there at once, first of all, they got to try to heat it. Um, and yeah, it's, it's too much space. I have heard people say that that demoralizes them, that there's no way they can fill up that cavity. Um, so you got to add space somewhat conservatively, but adding two honey supers during a nectar, nectar flow isn't isn't especially when a hive is that strong already. I mean, they they can take care of things, you know. And when it's at this height, and that's when they decide to swarm, you're not adding too much space. Like, how many? What are we talking about for the amount of bees in that in that size of a hive? A lot, <laughs> a lot. I mean, a four a four frame a, a four four boxes, so two deeps and two honey supers. They figure 160,000 bees. You know, so I, I, I honestly, I can't, I, I have no way of, I just know there's a lot of bees. Okay. Wait, have you had any uh, trouble, or have you ever tried bait boxes to catch that swarm that's leaving? And have you had any luck with catching Have I ever used a bait box to catch a swarm? I've used bait boxes to catch swarms that I've gone and placed out and around, never in my own yard. I've never had one of my own hive swarm. Oh. Um, that's, I... I, I'm breaking my bees up way too much. They, they don't have, when I'm managing these type of hives, these are not my own hives in my own yard. I am growing my apiary, I'm busting up hives. So these hives are hives that I manage for other people. They're staying in their yard, 
and I'm just, I'm just managing those bees. My own bee yard, I'm trying to grow my apiary. So I'm getting as many hives a season as I can. So I'm constantly busting them up. Right now, I don't currently get a whole lot of honey out of my own hives. Breaking up hives like that consumes resources. It consumes honey. 50% of the honey, that when they're making wax, they use 50% of the honey just to produce wax. You know, so it's, when you're busting up hives like that, they're constantly building wax, there's constantly, it's, so my own bees, I don't have a problem with my own bees swarming. I, 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 I'm breaking them up too much. So these big boxes that were last September or so, yep. what do they look like now? Are they maybe three brood boxes? We'll, we'll show a picture here a little bit farther on. Go ahead and. Oh, would this Go ahead and flip work that. if you wanted to keep an all media box high? Maybe just have five? medium brood boxes? The question is, is would this work if we're using all mediums? Yes, this, this still works with mediums. It takes three mediums to equivalent to the, be the same depth as two deeps. Oh, okay. So you're just, you're just adding... Three mediums equals one deep. E no, equals two deeps. Oh, two deeps. So r roughly, I mean, the, the amount of space that's in there is three, three mediums to two deeps. Okay. So you just have to stack on, you know, and if and it, you would still do your, you know, adding your boxes. You would do it a little more often, and you'd still raise that third and seventh frame up. Mm -hmm. um, you just the same amount of space. Um, what I would think maybe so three, five, maybe six. You'd have to experiment a little bit to see where that brood chamber is going to quit growing. Because at a certain yeah. point, she can't lay. I mean, she can only. She can only go so big, and that's actually, there's a lot of controversy between going with a two deep box or a three deep box or two chambered or three brood chambered boxes. Calculating the 2,000 or 3,000 eggs a day that she can lay, it's not possible for her to lay three deeps. I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the argument that's there when you do the math, and that's why I say, the, the queens, if they have the space, they can lay more than 3,000 eggs a day because I have three deeps that's a complete brood chamber, and I have had as many as three deeps and one medium um, equivalent of space as a brood chamber. In order for that to happen, she either has to lay more or I have to have two queens, which it happens a lot more often than people realize that there's two queens in the hive. Two queens um, in the same individual hive? Two in the same individual hive. Um, it's, it happens a lot more than people realize. And, and a, a lot of times why you don't see it is because you go through that hive, you're looking for the queen. Once you've found the queen, you quit looking. Sure. Um, so do they just stay enough away from one another where they won't eradicate the other one? So on, on the research aspect, on my part, how that happens is they're either sister queens or mother-daughter queens. And the mother, and, and generally, the mother's on her way out. Maybe her pheromones is, is getting less, so the daughter queen allows her to be there. And that makes her that, uh, that's from the research that I've been able to do. That's um, to to answer your question is is that can they do that? They do it, and why they do it, um, how they do it, I'm not real sure. I just know it happens a lot more often than we realize. Because when we go through a queen a hive, we're looking for the one queen and we quit looking. On, on my maintenance hives, I go through them hives top to bottom. You know, so I'm, I'm looking and I have found more than one queen in a hive. Um, not in all of them. It, it's, it's there and it may be that these large hives like that, it may be that they have two queens. That's how they get there. I, I have no idea. Cause natural environment that ever happened? Yes. Uh, I have heard that it has happened. Um, and some of these big bee trees that have been around for years and years, when they've gone and cleaned them out, um, one, I, I watched one documentary, they found three queens. Um, so, you know, how many queens can actually exist in that hive? I, I, te normally, the first queen out is going to sting and kill everything in there, and a, and a virgin queen is going to go kill the existing queen that's there if she's there. That's the normal process, but it happens 
the other way. I thought it would always be that way. Yeah. So this is what a beehive looks like when you start cranking it down. And when you, the first time I took a three brood chamber box and Doc knocked it down for the winter and I tried to put it into two, um, I looked at all the bees that are on the outside of them boxes and I said, there's no way. Them bees, I, I have to put another box on there. There's no way they can't fit in there. And I did. And I went and talked to somebody else. And I said, you know, how am I going to get that down to two boxes? They said, oh, they'll fit in there. I said, no, they won't. It's not possible. I mean, that hive is so loaded with bees, and the outside is so loaded with bees, they can't fit in there. They said, oh, yeah, they will. So I went back, and I shook all the bees out, and they, they fit in there. It just took them a little while, and they were in there and did their thing. So by the map, are you saying that each box has more than 50,000 bees in it? By the math, am I saying that? Um, There's, does anybody know how many are on a frame? How many cells are in a frame? I couldn't tell you right up to that. 1,500 on each side of a deep, I believe. Be on each side of a deep. Side of, a, of a super, of a medium. Yeah, so there's 10 frames. So you got 1,500 on a side. So you got 3,000 per frame. So you're 30,000 bees that can hatch. You know, that, that's what can hatch if it's full of bees. So what you're cramming in that space, yeah, you, you, I mean, you're... Now, do you still have your emery opening in there when you knock them down for the winter? Yes. It, it's still yes. There. So it's there all year? It, on my hives, I leave it there all year. Because in the wintertime, I have what's a, called a quilt box that I stick on top of there. On top of my... Now, what's that? It's a honey super with a screen on the bottom that I fill with cedar shavings. And then on top of that... I have a vent shim, so it's a three inch shim, similar to the emery shim, but it's just three inches tall, and it has three one inch holes drilled on each side with screen on the inside. That's, it's, I created my attic. The moisture comes up through the cedar shavings and goes out through the vents. Now I use cedar shavings because that's part of my mic control. So I built an attic on top of my beehive. Okay. So I have, a, I have a medium box. Depending on the strength of the hive, sometimes I run three deeps in the wintertime. Okay, so um, just say you, have, say you have two deeps, and then you have your emery shim, then you have your honey box. With a screen on the bottom, attached to the bottom. With a screen on the bottom, okay. So that's my quilt box. The screen holds my shavings up in that box. Now why do you want the screen on the bottom of it? To hold my cedar shavings so they don't go down onto my bees. I think it's for moisture control. Right. Oh, okay, so, but there's no honey in it then? There's no honey in it. Oh, it's no, an no, empty, no, it's no, a any no, Humpty no, super. Honey. Nope, it's a, it's an empty honey super okay. that I, I put a screen on gotcha. and I fill it full of cedar shavings. I hear those make good mice nests too. Mice I've, mice. so I had a very expensive lesson this year on mice. I've never had a mice problem. Our bee yard in, in Lone Pine, I had 37 hives there. I was just out there on Saturday. I lost every single hive except for one, and it was due to mice. We went, I was in about three, four weeks ago. I was there, out there, just a, a rough, went through the hives. I had nice, vibrant hives. They were, the balls were there. And when we went back, they were all dead and they had eaten out the center of all my combs and it was a big old mouse nest in there. Um, so that's my first experience with mice. I have never had mice go up into the quilt box. My, the mice, and th but this is my first experience having a problem with mice. How can we prevent that? You have a, uh, question is how can you prevent mice? They have what they call a mouse um, guard entrance and it looks like a L piece of metal that has a bunch of 3 8 inch holes drilled in it. That's um, how you keep them going in there. Some people take little tiny nails and space them out across the entrance, the, the entrance reducer, so the bees can come through and it keeps the mice out. There's there's a lot of different things that you can do. I did not because I've never had a problem. But I paid for it this year big time. Right. I, keeping bees is always a learning curve. Anybody who tells you that they know everything about bees, head the other direction. Um, because we have scientists that have spent their whole life work on bees and they might know their one area and they will tell you they're still learning about that one area. You know, so it's they believe that are going to be one queen, they're still in the priesthood. 
Yeah, so so when I when I first came across this, it was when I first got bees. I got them from a Russian man in Spokane. He kept bees for 40 years as a beekeeper. That was his job in Siberia. So once I learned that, my only question for him was, how do you overwinter bees? Yeah. You know, if they can keep them in Siberia, we can overwinter bees anywhere. He didn't speak any English. So his son was translating, and there was, it was hard to get through the translation. What I came away with is they used something they called a quilt box that was filled with wool. And even in Spokane, on the top of his hives, underneath the lid, he had a wool blanket that hung out about an inch all the way around his hives. That was how he wicked the moisture out. So when I came home, I looked up quilt box. Can anybody guess what I came up with? <laughs> Everything about sewing quilts. There was nothing about beekeeping. I had to type in beekeeping quilt box. As soon as I did that, there's a ton of information out there on quilt boxes for bees, which you don't run across in your normal research because it's kind of a separate, and the people who use them are generally a, a group all of their own. Most people don't use them. They're not, not even know anything about them. And when I researched them, they use anything from straw, leaves, um, grass, sawdust, shavings, whatever they can, wool. Um, wool is not all that readable to us here. Wool has a tendency to mold. Um, and I use cedar shavings because cedar shavings are a deterrent for mites. So that's part of my mite control is that cedar quilt box. And if my mites load is starting to get high, I will throw a qu them quilt boxes back on my hives. And so far to this point, I've been able to drive the mites out of my hive and keep my mite count within you know a percentage. And the only, in my mind, the only true way to get a true mite count is use an alcohol wash. You know, you, you're not going to know what your mite count. I, sticky boards, I, I haven't had real good luck with sticky boards. Um, other stuff gets on there. They don't get stuck there. So that's, that's why I used the cedar shavings. The other thing when I was doing that research, it said to drill a three-quarter inch hole in each end of the box. That's enough ventilation. On my first boxes that I had, I went out there. That extra space that I left there, it was jam-packed full of frost. Well, when frost starts warming up, frost turns to water. It's just going to drip on my hive. Being in the building industry all my life, I just built an attic. That's that three inch. And, and I didn't take any of the frost out. I just let it do its thing. I went in two weeks later. It was almost all gone. I went in again later, another two weeks, and I had just a little oval, about a quarter of an inch of frost. And, and that's what I see most of the time when I look at it, when I go in the winter into it now. So I don't use tar paper because I'm trying to raise northern hardy queens. Okay. Her question was, what do you do with wrapping the tar paper around the hive? I, I recommend that the hobbyists, you guys are just trying to get your bees to survive. You're not, you're not trying to raise anything. I'm selling bees to customers and I'm trying to, I'm trying to raise northern hardy bees Gen so that their genetics can withstand it. Wrap it with tar paper and cut out all the um, vent holes and entrances so that it can breathe. The reason you use tar paper is because it can go, it can breathe at the top. I don't, I wouldn't wrap it over the top of my lid, okay. um, but just, just the boxes themselves. Um, the other thing is, is it lets the moisture out when you do that, but it uses the infrared raises, even on a cloudy day, they come through the clouds, it'll heat up that black tar paper. So you're utilizing the natural heat that is there. If you insulate it with some kind of insulation, yeah, the, the hive itself produces some heat that it can maintain, but you're also trapping in the moisture. You know, and then you're not utilizing the natural heat that can help that hive, okay. you know. So it's plus minus sort of deal. Right. Okay, so is there a better way to orient, you know, your hive? The hive? Yeah. Um, if the entrance is a southeasterly direction, the morning sun is what you want to hit that hive, um, both wintertime and summertime. Summertime, it gets them up and going right away. A lot of the people that have bees in Lakeside, um, 
they really struggle with their bees to, to produce for them because they don't get sun on them hives until at least 10 o'clock is the earliest of the ones that I've talked to that can get and their hives they just don't ever get any real producing hives and that's mostly just because it does you know they don't get rolling until 10 o'clock and you know they're, they're if you can get the earlier you can get them up and rolling the more productive they can be outside of being a purist is it outside the realm of possibility to use like solar power dehumidification or solar power heat sources for winter things like that so the dehumidification I, I don't honestly know. Um, that kind of goes in. If what you need to keep bees alive is someplace dry, warm. I mean, warm to an extent, and and feed. So they need to be able to warm themselves. So you can't you can't have that ball of bees just hanging out in a tree. They're not going to survive. The wind's going to. So inside the hive, that they're able to warm that ball. If it's dry. You know they're able to keep that cluster warm, and if there's you know if they have feed. Was it essentially the same phenomenon as when you make a dead airspace, right? Like with a greenhouse, it's going to be warmer than the outside. Yeah, uh, yeah. That's 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 my take on it. Anyways, the question is is the same phenomenon if you dead airspace heating it. That's that's my. I mean, whether that's right or not, but that's my take on it. Right. Yep. One of the other things that a lot of people think, just having enough honey that your bees can't survive. Honey is all carbohydrates. They need protein in order to digest the carbohydrates. So the, the, that protein comes from pollen. And I actually just learned that this last fall. Um, we went to the Montana Beekeepers Association in Bozeman. And there was a nutritionist, bee nutritionist there, that talked about um, nutrition of bees through the through the winter. Um, so just because your bees have honey doesn't mean they won't starve. They have to have that protein in order to be able to break down the carbohydrates. So in February, you need to get a pollen patty in there, unless you know you happen to know that your hive has plenty of pollen throughout that hive. My own hives last year. They packed a ton of pollen in the bottom deep of the hive, um, but nothing up high. So when it's cold out, them bees ain't going to drop down and get that pollen and bring it up. They need a pollen source up by where they're at so they can get it. So there's, you know, there's some of that kind of stuff. You know, just because they have honey doesn't mean that they're not starving, and that's that's something that I learned just just last fall. And a lot of different beekeepers that I've talked to have never never heard or even thought of such a thing. Um, it's, and, and last spring, a lot of people lost hives, large hives, healthy looking hives in March. And there's different ones that said, oh, it was mites. Um, my take on mites, and he, he actually confirmed that on mites, is if you have a problem with mites, you're going to lose your bees early in the year, not after they made it through winter. Um, anything that's sick is going to die from cold early in the year rather than at once it starts warming up. So that's that made sense to me as far as why my bees died when they had plenty of honey, it was a big old ball of bees. They starved because they didn't have protein. So say so you reach February and you want to put one of those pollen patties in there and you've got it wrapped with tar paper, what how do you get them in there? How do you get it in there? If you have it wrapped the just the box is wrapped with tar paper and you don't have the the top wrapped you can pull that top out just and off. just pull it off you have to pull the the um, tells or the quilt box out of there right. but you're gonna have to put it back in right. um, I've never wrapped my hives so I guess I didn't think a whole lot on that if it was me if I had to I would cut that tar paper at that emery shim oh, um, so when I in February when I go in my hive Anywhere between 30 and 40 degrees, that's, if it's colder than 30 degrees, I'm not going in that hive. And at 30 degrees, I'm just opening that hive up, dropping that pollen patty in there, and I'm, and I'm shutting it. I'm not hanging around looking at anything. I'm just getting that pollen patty in there so that they can. And you're, 
They're laying it across the top of the frames? Laying it across the top of the frames. Yeah. And I, I generally don't lay it on top of the brood ball. I put it off to the side because, you know, your, your brood ball's going to sit there. I don't want to kill any bees, but I want to just get them that food that... Um, is there any particular bee that is best for up here? I haven't found that there is. So there's no I, I've had just as good a luck with all three, the Carniolans, Italians, and Russians. They say that the Russians are hardier. They say that the Carniolans are the next ones. But I personally haven't found a... a what about the temperament of, of those three groups just for handling? The temperament of all three groups. I, I have found that all three can be um, aggressive and all three can be mild. I, I, I haven't... The, the research that you, you do says that the Russians are um, hotter bees um, and that the Italians are the most calm bees. Um, I, I guess I haven't had enough experience to know if one is... To me, I've had calm Russians. Calm, and I say that kind of loosely because I've, I have... The bees that I purchased were colony Owens and Italians. Um, and I, but all the bees that I have in my yards, or I had in my yards, they were all caught from swarms. And to say Russians, I have blonde bees, which are more your Italian type of bees. I have the golden ones, which are your Carniolans. And I have the darker black bees, which are the Russians. I've caught them on swarms. Um, so I haven't purchased them that these are Russians, or these are Italians, or these are Carniolans. And, and make it. Right. So a lot of people say, well, I want, I want Italians because they're mild. Yeah. Um, well, there's a big price variance in a lot of these bees. The only ones that there's a price variance that I, that I know of in those three is the Russians tend to be harder to come by, so they're, they're a little more expensive. When you start getting into the Buckfast bees and, and that specific, the hygienic bees, you're looking at some more money, but those, if you're just looking at Italians, Russians, or Carniolans, they kind of float in that same dollar figure, especially the Italians and Carniolans. A lot of times, you, you know, they give you an option to have Italians or Carniolans, and when you actually get them, they're, they're the other one and they're all that. They, they don't break it down to, you know, these ones are Italians or those are Carniolans. And when I've questioned some of the suppliers on it, oh, they don't know the difference anyways. Nobody cares. You know, that's the response that I get. Right. So it's, when it comes down to the Italians and Carniolans, this year we just, we just told them they're just, they are what they are. We don't, because our suppliers, they're not getting us what they're saying they're getting us anyways. Some places you specify and you're taking their word that that's, you know, what right. they're going to get. Well, so the Russian right. bees, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Would the Russian bees have doping problems, do you think, that we'd have to be worried about? <laughs> <laughs> well, they're stronger, I want <laughs> <laughs> All right. Or back to each hive having its own personality. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Very much. Okay. Very much. Is there anyone in this area that's raising Russian bees that you know of? I have heard <sighs> that, um, I think it's Dave, Dave Hart, I think is, he's the only one that sells them. I've tried to get a hold of him to, because I have some customers that come in, that's what they want. He's a hard guy to get a hold of. Yeah. Um, so I don't, what is this? Dave Hart, he was wondering if anybody locally sells Russians. Okay. Um, he's the only one that I know of that sells Russians. I, he's, operation is back behind the airport, the international airport. H-A-R-T or -A -R. You know what, I don't even know if I'm saying it right. Okay. It's, it's Dave Hart. Does anybody know here? That used to be Flathead Honey, now they changed it to Northwestern Honey or something. Yeah. Are there any good clubs around here that you would suggest new people would want to go to? Yeah. Just the Flathead Valley Beekeeping Association. The question was, is are there any new clubs or any clubs in the valley? There's no, to my knowledge, there's just the one, the Flathead Valley. Valley Beacon. Columbia Falls still? Nope. At the Evergreen Fire Hall. Oh. They meet the last Tuesday of every month, 630. Evergreen Fire Hall. Someday we're going to make it there. You saying? Yeah. 
Yeah, it's been a, it's 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 a repairing club, I guess is how you would call it. It's um, it's growing. What time did you say it was? Six o'clock or six thirty? I mean, yeah, it was six o'clock. Did you? The last Tuesday of every month. We're overshooting our time, so unless there's any more direct questions, we'll. You're welcome. Thank you.